I would like, <clears throat> I will begin by adding my voice to the chorus of voices um, of thank you and recognition to Zarina and the others who conceived and put on this um, wonderful event. Um, I'd also like to mention Wayne State University Press and thank the press for um, being willing to, to uh, carry the project through and do such a great job with it. Um, Melba Boy is here in the audience and she'll be on the panel, the second panel, was um, instrumental in that, in her role as a series editor. Um, I also want to make a quick recognition um, or say a, a public hello to Barbara Harlow um, up from Texas, not quite as far as others, but um, uh, still very significant. Um, for uh, amazing intellectual development um, and, and mine as well at, at a bit of a distance. Uh, and then finally, uh, a thank you to Amanda and Mr. Ellis. I would like very much to say something that makes sense of the relationship, of the coincidence of the overlap between the subject matter of M. May's book and his passing. But I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of the day, I'll be able to a little bit. Um, so, what I'm going to do instead is uh, use my time to um, introduce a little music into this space, into this conversation, uh, for obvious reasons, because music is important, central to AMA scholarship in general, to the book in particular, and also, perhaps more importantly, music, as we just heard, was um, a passion, important, central part of AMA's life. Right up there with Amanda and Marley, I would imagine. <laughs> One of the favorites. The favorites. So three, three quick uh, musical moments, if you will. And these moments, um, they uh, they each play with or speak to the, the theme of, of death-bound existence um, for black men, but they also highlight particular moments along AMA's intellectual trajectory and the the. Um, Life of the book. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so I'm, thank you. Uh, yes, 2.45. This first, which play, I'm play a, a bit of a few different songs. The first is called They Reminisce Over You by Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth from 1992. <laughs> That song is obviously a, a artist speaking about people, uh, one of his friends and a couple of family members who passed away. And the song has been in my head a lot. I'm off and on again. Um, and thinking about today. So the song was uh, from 1992, so it came out just uh, before MA began graduate school. Um, and uh, MA and I went to graduate school together, so I wanted to reminisce a bit over um, our time together. Uh, and I think it, it helps, it, there are some interesting um, elements of that time that uh, shaped the book, shaped AMA's intellectual and the book. Uh, we um, taught together. We were TAs in, for a class called uh, African American Culture. It was the core course for the Center for Afro American, um, uh, African American and African Studies. Oh, forgive me, I, I should back up and say that 
Um, well, this is appropriate time to say. I'm also in, in it, playing that song, and it makes me think about two other people who were there at the time. Um, it, it, we're in graduate school together, University of Texas, at the same time with M.A. and I, who um, preceded him in their past. And that's uh, Vincent Woodard, who was a graduate student in English first, I believe, and then American Studies, um, and, and who shared space with, with us in the Center for African American African Studies, which we call the Center. And uh, John Warfield, who I'll say a little bit more about um, in, in a minute. Well, I'll, I'll say now, John um, Warfield, who we affectionately call Doc, was the founding director of the center. By the time we were there in the 1990s, he was on the faculty, and, and he actually taught the course, and we TA for him. Uh, he had uh, Parkinson's disease, and it, uh, so as time went on, his TAs increasingly took a more role to the class. So. By the time uh, I came along, A.M.A. and I, in effect, taught the class. Um, Dr. Dr. Warfield, or Doc, was the faculty of record. So, um, Doc was still very um, engaging and personable and um, mentor figure to us. And so, with him there and us teaching together, we were, at the time, we were also going through our program and determining our topics and so forth. Uh, we were able to engage each other in, in ideas and subject matter. And at that time, initially, A.M.A. and Barbara were um, correct me or add, and May's interest, he was actually in the um, comparative literature program, and his, in his interests were more, much more diasporic. Did he mention that? Um, and I remember him often talking about the f figure of Caliban and uh, Retamar. Um, and uh, I think, as I look back, as we taught this class in African American culture, it was through engaging the text we use and engaging the students that AMA's interest moved, um, grew into the areas which um, were dealt with in the book. So I'm talking about the mid-1990s. So many of the, the cultural texts he describes that he analyzes as well as uh, events he, he describes, such as uh, Tupac's death in the fall of 1996, um, Biggie's death the next spring in March 97. We were teaching at the same time and so this book reflects his engagement with those ideas, those events, those texts, and those students, those undergraduate students, in these years. Um, for instance, uh, what, Salah can speak to this, who was also there. M.A. and I were, in some ways, studying contrast. Uh, M.A. would wear his uh, Lee suits, well yeah. tailored, and so forth, and I, I still have given, I'm given to this. I wear my Close it a little bit too large for me. Um, he being a literature scholar, um, in comparative literature in particular, me being uh, a budding historian, we had those, uh, I often heard him uh, berate me for my insufficient theoretical basis. <laughs> um, and so what we did in the class, when we broke up the class, we would, would teach obviously to things that we, were, we knew about or were learning about, professor know about, and that included picking particular texts which we would be responsible for. So I would do an autobiography on someone dealing with the civil rights or black power period, and he often did a, a memoir or a novel. He did uh, Sapphire's Push a couple of years, and he did um, Nathan McCall's Nixon Warner Holly a few times. So I think that his analysis there began, um, or at least had some of his important workings through in, in that important space. And I think that's important because we've heard and we'll hear more about M.A. as a teacher and how that was related to his scholarship. Um, MSU certainly fostered that, but with all respect, he didn't begin here. He, uh, Texas helped to foster that. And Mr. Ellis will probably say that it, it goes back before that as well. <laughs> um, I also recall when A.M.A. was writing his uh, dissertation, or even before actually dissertation, but working on Richard Wright, um, him telling me that, that Barbara was really pushing him to get the historical context of Chicago, Chicago down. Because that was a way for him to really have a strong analysis of Native Son. And in our opening remarks, we, we, you told us that uh, A.M.A., it was a very well-known text, but A.M.A. gave this very original reading. And then you, if you notice, the first chapter begins with what's happening in, the, in Chicago and African Americans coming to the city and so forth. So I, I, my recollection suggests to me that that is a direct expression of Barbara's tutelage and A.M.A.'s um, hard work during that period. Um, 
something else that we did, uh, actually AMA took the lead on this, was something called the Professor Series, which was a speaker series of uh, prominent scholars in, in different um, disciplines, all but all in the broader field of African American studies. And so AMA had the vision and marshaled the resources and brought this amazing roster of speakers to campus. Mm -hmm. Robert Kelly, Abdul Jam Muhammad, uh, Angela Davis, Hazel Carby, Cedric Robinson. Um, and some of you were there, may recall others who I'm forgetting. Um, and so that was another part of MA's intellectual uh, trajectory. His intellectual development um, and, and his vision. Title song of the album by artist Raskas, who um, is described in, in the book. On page 57, you, you'll, for those who have the text with you, if you take out your text. <laughs> um, and they cites a couple of lines. Now, he actually originally wanted several more lines there, but we're not able to include all of them. So, you just have a couple, I think, three lines there, if I recall correctly. Which one? Oh, yes, all right. So, we're going to listen to the first minute and a half, roughly, minute and 22 seconds. And at the end of this the period, the sec section we're going to hear, you'll see the lines mm -hmm. referenced there. But I'd ask you to, to, to try to hear the first few lines before it. One of them is set off in a parenthetical in the paragraph. Um, and you see the, the treatment it gets in the text, how it fits in. What I want to suggest is that MA was becoming an African American Studies scholar. I don't mean to say that to police the borders or to, to, to say he was not no longer an English scholar or, or critical study scholar, um, cultural study scholar, or anything. What I want to say is that it was all of those. And that's what um, the, the field of African American Studies at its best really does is, is speaks to and, and provides conversations between various disciplinary um, uh, focuses and um, spaces of knowledge. And so th that's the moment that MA is becoming this African American Studies scholar that um, uh, produces this book. Okay, final, final musical moment is um, the saddest. This is contemporary. This, um, I want to just play, a, make reference to two songs from um, last year. Uh, from an album called Wake Up by uh, John Legend with The Roots. The Roots, by the way, is a musical group which M.A. also brought to campus uh, in the 90s. He also was bringing musical performances to campus. Um, this song is called Little Ghetto Boy. Some of you may remember the song by uh, Donny Hathaway from 1970 or 71. This is a cover of that song. So. Um, the third moment I want to say now is me making a suggestion of what type of scholarly work, what type of areas of inquiry that MA's book might open up. Um, I'll play it first. So the song, John Legend, contemporary R&B singer in the Roots, remake the song, but it, they also include um, a thing that's called a prelude. A remake in 2010 of a song from 1970 or 71, a year or two after M.A.'s birth. More importantly, this early 1970s moment, there are four things which converge, four social developments, which help to create the types of um, uh, cultural texts and, and broader cultural um, context that M.A. is describing. One is the end of the Black Power Movement and the criminalization, in some sense, of, of black protests. Two is the emergence of so-called urban crisis, which was which was connected to the emergence of black pluralities and majorities in urban America. Before the 1970s, most cities were not seen as, as they are now, as play, particular inner cities, as places of black residents. So this is a phenomenon from that period. Third is the birth of hip hop, which has emerged in the early 70s. And in, in a footnote to one of the um, I forgot which chapter, MA identifies 1974 as the particular year of hip hop's emergence. And fourth is the beginning of the phenomenon we now call mass incarceration, hyper, hyper incarceration. Um, of, of American citizens in general, particularly of people of color, of African American men, through the war on drugs and other mechanisms, even at times of broader crime rates going down. So this is a, these are all part of our, these are all, have all created our contemporary moment. And May's text um, brings these together. And so A. May's text can point the way for scholars to, to explore the contemporary moment, how it has its roots in this history and these cultural texts and I think ultimately to, to try to engage in contemporary um, ideas and actions to, to um, respond to the, to the challenges that we have before us. Thank you.